yesterday morning I told my wife I'm flying out to LA to be kind of the wet blanket at the picnic. And having uh, listened to Alex's talk this morning, I think that what I have to share with you is maybe going to be less contrarian than I thought it was going to be yesterday. I think that's good. Very encouraging. Uh, and Paul told me a few minutes ago that there's lots of opinions in this room, there's lots of divergence about philosophy, policy, goals, and what have you. But I think we agree on more than we disagree about. And I'm going to suggest two things that I think just about everybody here would agree on. One is we'd all like to see growth in rail passenger service. Uh, I would define growth differently perhaps from the way some others would. Uh, this is not something that's funded by the National Endowment for the Arts. This is not kinetic art. We're talking about a productive transportation service, dare I say business. Uh, it would be the performance would be measured by its output of transportation, growth in passenger miles, growth in social relevance. In the last 10 years, we've had declining output, we've had a shrinking network, and we've had declining social relevance despite record levels of federal subsidization. What's wrong in that picture? And the financial results aren't very good. It doesn't support growth, it inhibits it. Growth is not possible so long as we're dependent on massive subsidization. The subsidy is controversial, it's hard to come by, and it comes with political strings attached to it. That's not a very healthy environment for anybody to try to grow a business or a, or a service organization however you choose to, to think of it. And 30-year history confirms that. Step back away from the passion that we all share for improving America's rail passenger service and look at the results. Year after year after year after year, massive subsidization has produced a shrinking network with shrinking output. Last year, ridership was up a little tiny bit, mostly on the strength of Midwest corridor markets, but passenger miles were down again. The network was down again. Available seat miles were down last year. Train miles were down last year, despite the biggest subsidies Amtrak has ever had. The Bush administration has presided over a doubling of Amtrak subsidy, and the network is still shrinking up. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, and Alex talked about this a lot, and it's very refreshing to hear this, about the effective deployment of capital, where we get a bang for the buck of capital deployed. Let's look at some charts. These numbers, again, are based on Amtrak's preliminary 2006 number. Bill, if you go to the first chart, uh, I'm going to walk you through four different charts that compare two groups of trains. These are two groups of routes based in Chicago, Group A and Group B. And then I'm going to ask you to draw some conclusions about which of these two groups is doing better, which of these two groups you think Amtrak would do better to invest in. Uh, group uh, first slide shows ridership, transaction volume. Pretty close. B is a little bit higher than A. A few more people use the, the, the group B train, so let's, let's do a look at uh, load factors. Load factors tell you two things. You've got a real load factor chart up there with the pie graphs and the Amtrak uh, passenger miles per train mile load factor measure. This shows you capital efficiency, where your assets are being well used. It also shows you where you are relatively over-invested in the market or under-invested. And those markets, like so many of our quarter, short quarter markets, where load factors are in the 30% range or 40% range, we are relatively over-invested. Because you've got inventory you can't give away. Let's look at the next slide. Oh, look at this one, output. Which group's doing better in terms of producing actual transportation, people carried over distance? And Bill, let's go to the next slide. Money. <coughs> uh, group, uh, group B is bringing in a lot more money than Group A, five times as much. Now let's go to the next slide. Here's all four of these measures together. I know which one I'm in favor of if I'm a manager. I've got capital that I want to invest to improve things to, and to grow the business. Which group am I going to go to? Right. Group A. Group A is all eight of the regional corridor markets radiating out from Chicago. Group B is all eight of the long distance markets radiating out from Chicago. Does this tell you anything interesting about where to deploy capital to produce growth? And my name is all together. 
yarns all of this, right? B is the ghost starlight. A is the surf planners. Not five years ago, the starlight produced more output and more revenue than all of the San Diegans combined. And it's only since we've had the aggressive expansion of the San Diegans north of Los Angeles and the collapse of the starlight that the starlight even starts to lag on my most important measures of performance of output and revenue. I want to grow the business. Which of these two do I focus on? Which one is short capacity and has a lot of growth potential? Which one can't I give away more than half has shown us repeatedly, consistently, that the greatest growth opportunities in this system, oddly perhaps, come from some of the lowest cost changes and innovations that you can bring into the system? Amtrak has a lot of money at its disposal. You know, a billion dollars maybe isn't what it used to be, but it's a lot of money. And every year, lately, Amtrak has handed $1.2, $1.3, $1.4 billion to invest. I would argue that they're simply investing it in the wrong places. That's why the network's shrinking. That's why output is declining. That's why market share is declining. What we really need, I think you saw it here this morning, is a different vision that leads to a different application of capital. What I'm troubled by is that what Mr. Kumant is reporting to you is that the applications of capital that he seems to be advocating are state leveraged short quarters. You can see from the numbers it's not there. That's not where growth is possible. That's more of the same. If I had his job, the first thing I'd do with capital is I'd throw out their management information system, their whole route accounting system. It leads them to bad decisions. Get rid of them. I bring in, I don't know who I bring in, one of the big consulting firms to build me a new MIS so that you can make intelligent decisions about where to maximize your return on capital. What would you do with the fleet? The answer is you build a more tightly integrated network out of your existing routes. You weave what you've got together. This is the way you finesse the industry constraints that are very real, very intractable, extremely difficult and expensive to fix. I offer you the example of the Albany Hub. It's a very simple illustration of this. You see on the left-hand side the way Amtrak operates two trains, the Maple Leaf and the, uh, the Montreal train. Adirondack. Come up out of New York every morning. They overlap as far as Schenectady and then go their separate ways. And there's no synergism here at all. Just two different trains running two regional routes. I would take one of those trains, I don't think it matters which one, toss a coin, pick your favorite, and have it originate at Boston. 60 miles farther from Albany than New York is, so yes, you've got another hour of crew labor, you got a few more gallons of diesel fuel, <coughs> but you build a regional network with almost no incremental expense, the same trains running almost the same number of train miles. Two minutes, I've got to talk fast. <laughs> you're, not, you're not hungry, are you? Yes. <laughs> this simple kind of networking change, and there's no new route miles here either, you'll observe, would increase the output of these two trains by multiples. We're not talking about 10% increments. This could double the output of these two trains. And the, the dotted line on the right-hand side shows the Connecticut River Valley route that also is part of that. <coughs> Very slight additive increases in cost drive multiplications of output.